Hi everybody, welcome to week six. This is Kelly, your instructor, and we're going to talk about alterations in urinary elimination, inflammatory bowel disorders, and digestion. Let's get started. Okay, so urinary elimination. Um, there's a few alterations in urine production. Uh, one is polyuria or diuresis. Uh, this is where you're urinating a lot, where the patient is. Anuria, which is really no urine production, that's bad. And oliguria, which is an uh, abnormally small amount of urine production, and that's not all that great. Could produce into an anuria uh, situation. And altered urinary elimination include urinary frequency, Nocturia, urinating a lot at night. Urgency, dysuria, uh, urinary hesitancy, neurological bladder, incontinence, and retention. So let's talk about urinary incontinence. Um, there's a few different ones, and your book should um, tell you what these are. Stress incontinence, urge incontinence, reflex incontinence, overflow incontinence, and functional incontinence. So it'd be good to know the differences between these two, or these one, two, three, four, five. Uh, nursing assessment, we're going to observe and uh, interview the patient about voiding patterns, urinary description, urinary problems. Uh, what's your fluid intake like? Um, environmental factors, stress, disease, history of diagnostic and surgical procedures. Um, some diagnostic tests would be your urinalysis, a culture to see if there's any bacteria in the urine, post-void post residuals. So once the patient urinates, you check and see if there's anything in the bladder. 24-hour urine collection, a 24-hour urine output. Um, there should be at least 30 milliliters per hour um, bladder scan to see if there's anything in the bladder. <coughs> Intravenous pyolography, pyolo pyolo you know, you can see it. Cystoscopy, CT, MRI, and renal scan. Some implementations for this. Um, we could monitor intake and output, uh, catheter care if they have a catheter, fully catheter. Incontinence interventions include Kegel exercises, look those up. Behavioral modifications include scheduling toileting, habit training, bladder training, and absorbent pads and belt briefs if needed. Uh, we want to be collaborative, so some pharmacological therapies include uh, anticholinergics, uh, neurological bladder, urge incontinence, th that's what those are good for. Cholinergic uh, stimulates bladder contraction and voiding. Diuretics, um, increase fluid excretion and prevent reabsorption, and five alpha redase inhibitors. So look that up. Uh, dialysis and surgery. Uh, urine retention, um, inability to empty the bladder. Um, there could be some acute clinical manifestations. Sudden painful inability to void full bladder that could be a medical emergency some causes are surgical procedures medications utis urinary tract infections excessive intake of fluid or alcohol and benign prosthetic hyperplasia or bph large uh, prostate some clinical manifestations include there could be painless um, increase in residual urine volume. That's after you urinate, then there's some in your bladder. Difficulty starting or maintaining urination, weak flow, frequent urination with a little results, uh, continue to feel the need to avoid after toileting, and overflow voiding incontinence. <coughs> and since we have a lot of slides, I'll probably have you read some. Uh, so implementations, uh, we can 
we need to treat immediately uh, by catheterization if we need to. Um, be cautious when draining urine rapidly. Indwelling catheter or intermittent catheterization. Uh, surgery, and that's these items here. Or we could think of pharmacologic therapy. All right, so inflammatory bowel disease. And we're gonna talk about two in particular, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So it's a collection of chronic inflammatory conditions of the intestines, um, some re remissions, sporadic flares of active disease. One is ulcer ulcerative colitis. It affects the mucosa, submucosa of the colon and the rectum and superficial abscesses. Crohn's disease um, may affect any portion of the GI tract. Deeper lesions, malabsorption and malnutrition are a problem and it causes protein loss and blood loss. Let's see. So we've already mentioned that ulcerative colitis, yeah, that affects that. Um, Crohn's disease is transmural inflammation condition that affects any part of the GI tract. We already talked about that. And I'll let you read that last one. Some statistics. Approximately 3 million adults in the United States have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Um, there's a lot of people here. I'll let you read that. Some pathophysiology on ulcerative colitis, or UC, um, usually begins in the rectal sigmoid area and progresses proximally. Um, I'll let you read some of these here. You know, pseudopolyps may develop, and chronic inflammation leads to atrophy, narrowing, or shortening of the colon. For Crohn's disease, I'll let you read all that too, but um, let's see. Now, the affected bowel takes on a cobblestone appearance with fissures and ulcers. Um, surrounding islands of intact mucosa. Give me a few seconds. And we're going to talk about etiology. So we're not quite sure where IBD uh, or why IBD is caused, really. It could be genetic, environmental, infectious, or immune factors. Autoimmune and lifestyle factors like smoking may contribute to its development. Maybe not, it's hard to tell. A few risk factors, typically between 15 and 30 years old, um, and may have another peak between 50 and 80 years old. Ethnicity higher in the white population, especially American Jews and European descent. Increased rates in black and Hispanic populations, particularly in urban areas, uh, genetics. Smoking may increase Crohn's disease, but probably not ulcerative colitis. Lack of physical activity increases Crohn's risk. High fiber diets may lower Crohn's risk. Previous antibiotic use increases Crohn's risk. So let's talk about the nursing process. And this is kind of an overarching theme of most of our uh, lectures. IBD cannot be predicted or prevented, but effective management can help prevent complications. Uh, emphasize adherence to regime or treatment regime. A thorough assessment required for these patients includes psychosocial, especially non-adherence concerns, particularly in adolescence. Maintain an open communication with patients, especially the introductory phase. Offer foster trust and allow the adolescent to feel in control. Um, ensure privacy and confidentiality. Some nursing diagnoses could be um, risk for fluid volume deficit from diarrhea, 
uh, weight loss or nutritional de deficiencies, constipation, diarrhea, acute care or acute pain, chronic pain, anxiety, and disturbed body image, especially if uh, somebody has to have a colostomy or ileostomy. Some planning or goals: uh, collaborate with the healthcare team and the patient in planning for these two uh, diseases. And optimize nutritional status during ex exacerbations and re remissions. Develop positive coping strategies for the patient or help them do that. Provide self-care with disease prevention and management. Implementation for fluid volume. I'll let you read some of these here. Constipation management, um, adequate fluid intake. Um, only use healthcare provider recommended laxatives. Promoting body image, um, address frustration and anxiety related to fecal elimination. Uh, discuss physical changes and their consequences. I'll let you read the rest. Promote adequate nutritional intake. I think that's a big one. That provide a prescribed diet, offer nutritional or parental nutrition if enteral by mouth absorption is impaired. Arrange dietary consult. Uh, provide and administer elemental enteral nutrition and supplements. Uh, provide family members or involve family members in teaching. And the evaluation, expected outcomes could include absence of GI symptoms, successful medication management without adverse effects, and no signs or symptoms of infection. And moving on to digestion. All right, so nausea and vomiting are a couple of alterations. Um, Nausea would be an uncomfortable sensation, and vomiting with a, being a forceful expulsion of stomach contents through the mouth. Nursing assessment include um, information from the patient about the symptoms, subjective. Some objective would be physical assessment. Health promotion includes education, proper nutrition, um, hydration, fiber-rich diet, weight management, some independent interventions for digestion or altered digestion that provide comfort measures, um, clear fluids and ice chips for the acute phase of that, um, educate on avoiding triggers, administer anti-medic medications and monitor for effectiveness. Third, gastroesophageal reflux disease involves gastric content flowing back into the esophagus, causing heartburn, affects 15 to 20 percent of adults, and is also prevalent in children. Symptoms can vary, uh, dry cough, asthma, sore throat, or difficulty swallowing. Some pathophysiology, that's where uh, the lower esophageal sphincter normally stays closed, but the problem lies with the, sphinx, the sphincter relaxing and uh, or incompetence or increased gastric pressure. Etiology and risk factors include uh, increased gastric volume, uh, specific positions, increased gastric pressure, Risk factors are obesity, alcohol consumption, and smoking, like with everything else. Hiatal hernia and pregnancy. Gastric juices contain acid, pepsin, and bile. Prolonged exposure leads to reflux, esophagitis, or inflammation. Prevention. Um, eating smaller, more frequent meals could help. 
avoid food stimulating acid production. Don't really eat close to bedtime. Elevate the head of the bed. Avoid tight fitting clothes. And you can read the last two. So the nursing process for this um, focuses on symptom relief and patient education. Interventions depend on symptom frequency. So we're gonna assess um, the patient interview, assess health history, including heartburn and chest pain. <clears throat> Some chest pains can be related to GERD. Determine when symptoms occur. Is it night, day, before, or after meals? Inquire about intolerance to specific foods. Uh, record regurgitation descriptions and symptom triggers. Assess swallowing difficulties. Ask about antacids or over-the-counter medications. Physical exam, check vital signs, weight, and nutritional status. Uh, inspect the abdomen for distension. Auscultate bowel sounds. Uh, palpate the abdomen for epigastric tenderness. Examine mouth and throat, teeth, gums. Note breath of odor, or yeah, breath odor. Nursing diagnosis include inadequate health maintenance skills, acute pain, a lack of knowledge about nutrition, which I think a lot of people have, impaired gastrointestinal mobility or motility. Planning or goals would be to decrease the discomfort, uh, some kind of symptom management plan, lifestyle and dietary changes, understanding GERD's long-term consequences, and achieving and maintaining a healthy weight. Oh, we're going to keep this one kind of short. A few more slides. Implementation help the patient manage epigastric pain, encourage small frequent meals, uh, refer smokers to some kind of cessation program, teach the proper use of medications, educate long term or on long term lifestyle changes. Evaluation assess patient adherence to care plan, uh, freedom from heartburn pain relief, verbalize understanding of GERD and lifestyle changes, and demonstrate ability to manage symptoms. And let's see, the next one is, ah, just a note here to be sure to read all of the required sections. Uh, be familiar with the nursing processes for all of these. And I think we've covered all of that in this lecture um, on Friday or whenever class is. <clears throat> We're going to go over case studies for all of this, including um, everything that we talked about, uh, plus how some of them relate to other topics. All right, until next time.